Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault in Lviv, inside Ukraine, a country and its people in the grips of war. Relentless shelling from the air traps civilians on the ground. And for many who escape, the heartache of families torn apart. And inside old war bunkers that many are preparing to use again. How do you keep it together for them? We just uh, told them that this is a game. Complete coverage from inside Ukraine. I'm Ian Hedemansing. Also tonight, mortgage denied because of someone else's bad credit. This can't be real. Why even simple errors on your credit check can take months to fix. And Canadian star Ryan Reynolds on fame. My highest goal in show business was to be the wacky neighbor in a sitcom. And giving back. To make Canada a better place, and at the end of the day, that's kind of the goal. It's like I grew up, I grew up here. The interview you don't want to miss. This is The National. This is Lviv, Ukraine. For days, this has been a place to flee to. Increasingly, it's becoming a place to flee from. Have a look at the lineup of people trying to get out. The trains that run from this station go all night long. The United Nations estimates that 1.5 million people have left this country in barely 10 days. And Western Ukraine, this city of Lviv, is in a tough spot. The more important it becomes as a hub for humanitarian aid and military supplies, the more vulnerable to attack it becomes. Anxiety here is building. The Ukrainian president has called on citizens to take up arms and resist the Russian invasion across the country. And increasingly, where civilians aren't being called into war, they're being forced into it, facing mortal danger, whether they stay or whether they run. We don't know the true number of the dead, but the toll undeniably rose today. So we are no longer at the train station. A curfew kicks in at 10 p.m. here. You can't be on the streets. The lights need to be dimmed. People listen for sirens primed to head to shelters. Susan Ormiston will show you why the fear and the fury is incandescent and growing. Russia is trying to crack key Ukrainian cities open with results that are sickening, tragic, and a warning here, not at all easy to watch. For a second day, Russian forces pummel Irpin, striking terror. Panicked residents run for safety with no cover. The most vulnerable struggle to hurry under stress. With Ukrainian soldiers unable to stop the mortars, helping people get out if they can. But as some try to make it across an exposed road, civilians clearly visible. Shit. 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 Another mortar. And as the smoke clears, on the far side, a family lies dying. Come on, medic! A man yells for a medic, but it's too late. Four die here, including two children. Their names added to the growing list of innocent people killed in this war not even two weeks old. In Mariupol in the south, where shelling has trapped hundreds of thousands, a planned evacuation failed again today. Ukraine says Russia broke an agreed ceasefire with shelling. Ukraine is begging the West to help protect its citizens from airstrikes. <laughs> In Lviv, far from the bombs to the east, ordinary men are being trained. To use an AK-47, most have never handled one. An ex-Ukrainian soldier puts them through their drills, maneuvers they never thought they'd have to learn in office jobs in IT or finance. But if the Russian attacks draw closer, these volunteers want to defend their neighborhoods and their families. Now it's simultaneously like working and fighting. <laughs> Problem is they don't have guns, only a few for training. Most of the weaponry, they say, is at the front, and an hour's instruction, no match for a trained fighter. But Ukraine is asking its citizens to stand up. You could, like, look in my eyes and see that we haven't fear. We could, like, take weapon and... You have no fear? Yeah. 
everyone here. Yeah, everyone here, they try to be ready for everything that happened around us. Every man of fighting age, 18 to 60, has to register for mobilization. It's the law, and the lines stretch long. Yuri, how would you feel about being called up to serve? It's okay, that's my duty, you know. That's, I have to do that <laughs> as a citizen. That's, that's what I have to do. Tough decisions every day of this war. So there's a lot to talk about here, but keeping that 10 p.m. curfew in mind, Susan and I met earlier on the street to talk about change. So, Susan, we decided to meet right here in part because of statues like this one. You know, being wrapped, physically protected, it really speaks to the change that's happening here. What do you make of the shift, you see? Yeah, we're seeing change, pockets of resistance and a lot more protection. We took a drive around the city. We're seeing large checkpoints now, sandbag, militia are checking cars, they're checking documents on highways coming from the mm -hmm. east and then little side roads leading to villages. The neighbors are setting up their own barricades with their own sandbags and homemade watchtowers. You know, Lviv is becoming a city of refuge, really. Hundreds of thousands of people are now coming through here and they're coming because it's relatively secure now and they're trying to get to the border, but they're not taking anything for granted. All right, Susan, thank you. Beyond what's happening on the streets, preparations are also underway underground. Earlier, I went inside an old war bunker being dug out by residents just in case neighbors need shelter. So there is some dispute about when exactly this was built. We've been speaking with people uh, in their 60s and 70s who say they used to play in here as little kids. Some think it is significantly older, perhaps uh, around the era of the First World War. You can see evidence, obviously, of old locks and brand new electricity. So it's kind of interesting looking around. I'll have more on the preparations coming up, plus the mother and the two young children who we met inside. Now, from those digging in to those scrambling to flee, the United Nations says what is unfolding now in Europe is the fastest growing refugee crisis since the Second World War. Of the more than 1.5 million people who have fled Ukraine, about a million have gone to Poland alone. Other neighboring countries, including Romania, are also seeing a surge. Margaret Evans has the view from the Ukraine-Romania border where there is fear and grief among people on the run. This is Ukraine, hemorrhaging, and it's impossible to look away. Its western borders now home to a relentless flow of heartache as families part ways. The women and children traveling on, hopefully, to safety, and the men back to a war many in a watching world fear they cannot win. Those who make it this far come carrying tales of horror. Victoria Honcharenko is from Kharkiv, on the other side of the country. There is no Kharkiv anymore, she says, only dead bodies on the streets. She, her sister and their children spent the night in the car waiting in line at the border. Their husbands stayed behind, men between 18 and 60 not allowed to leave. Ina Dubinska and her son Oleksiy only made it out of Kyiv with the help of volunteers. But when they tried to cross, they were turned back because Oleksiy didn't have an exemption from the army. How is this possible, he asks. I'm her son and I'm not considered her guardian. Will they take care of her? Those dropping off friends or loved ones wait until the very last moment to say goodbye trying to keep warm and to stay strong. Rustis Sharima is seeing off his wife, three of his four sons, and the family cat and dog. So these guys are going, but you're staying. Yeah, we have to, we're, we're staying oldest? together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm the oldest. How do you feel about that? Staying calm. Just staying calm, and that's it. The, for me, the most important is so that they would live. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll, 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 we'll solve the problem. Yeah. Yep. Everything will be all right. But nothing feels right about what's happening here or to Ukraine. The Russian invasion so fast and so brutal that many in these long lines look dazed, as if in a dream. If only it were. Margaret Evans, CBC News, along Ukraine's border with Romania. 
So that dazed, dreamlike feeling Margaret described is, of course, magnified by the speed at which this has all happened. And Adrian, that destruction is getting worse as Russia tries to move in on key cities. Russia struck an airfield deep inside the country, trying to tighten its grip on Ukraine's skies and protect its own forces. Their prime target, Kyiv. They're pushing towards the capital from the west into the suburbs, including Irpin that you saw in Susan's story, but also from the east. The goal is to surround the city. Just as civilians try to flee, Ukrainian soldiers and volunteers are preparing to defend Kyiv's outskirts using whatever means they have. In the south, Russian forces are trying to advance towards Odessa. But right now, Mykolaiv stands in their way. And Kherson, which Russia took control of days ago, is showing signs of resistance. This weekend, about 2,000 people rallied in the city's central square against Russia's invasion. It's not clear how Russian forces responded to the protest. Adrian, there were reports they fired into the air to try to disperse the crowd. Indeed. And meanwhile, Ian, uh, the Western allies are weighing how best to support the people here. So without provoking a major escalation from Russia, that's hard to do. As Katie Simpson reports, in the U.S., the need is bringing about some rare bipartisan agreement. American fighter jets may soon be part of a three-way agreement to get more military support into Ukraine. A plan is being discussed to provide U.S. fighter jets to Poland should Poland give up some of its fleet to Ukraine. The U.S. saying it does not see this as an escalation of tensions. No, that, that, that gets a green light. In fact, we're talking uh, with uh, our Polish friends right now about what we might be able to do to backfill uh, their needs if, in fact, they choose to provide these fighter jets to, to the Ukrainians. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky pleaded with U.S. lawmakers for more air support during a Zoom call. On Capitol Hill, there is rare bipartisan support for getting more planes to Ukraine and for banning Russian oil and gas imports. It's the people in my state of West Virginia mm -hmm. believe it's basically foolish for us to keep buying products and giving profit and giving money to Putin to be able to use against the Ukrainian people. That's exactly what he's doing. President Vladimir Putin has said Western sanctions are akin to an act of war. While his defense ministry warned if neighboring countries allow Ukraine to even use the airfields, that country would be considered involved in the armed conflict. In trying to keep the lines of communication open, the French president says he spoke with Putin and then later Zelensky, tweeting out, We are striving to preserve the integrity of Ukraine's civilian nuclear plants. In addition to other priority demands, we presented to Russia a ceasefire and the protection of civilians. Allies don't appear to have much hope Russia's assault will stop anytime soon. I think we have to be prepared uh, for this to last for some time. The U.S. is now looking at more long-term support. This week, Congress is expected to pass a $10 billion aid package, which includes more money for the refugee crisis and for Ukraine's security. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. The International Atomic Energy Agency is extremely concerned by that situation at Ukraine's Zaporizhia power plant. It is Europe's largest nuclear power plant, which caught fire during an attack on Friday. Now, Russia is now in control, placing the staff under its command and restricting communications. That has the UN nuclear watchdog worried that it cannot operate safely. And he and the security of that nuclear power plant will be certainly top of mind for the Prime Minister this week. And that's just one of the topics Justin Trudeau will be discussing, Adrian, with European leaders. Arriving late today in London, this trip is focused on Ukraine. Starting Monday, the Prime Minister will sit down with NATO allies. Travis Danraj is traveling with the Prime Minister. Justin Trudeau arrives to Europe in the midst of the greatest security challenge it's faced since the Second World War. This trip is meant to demonstrate strength and solidarity between Canada and its allies, but pressure is building for NATO, for the democratic world to do more. The Prime Minister will meet with world leaders in the UK, Germany, Latvia and Poland, and also visit Canadian Forces members stationed in the region. 
Tomorrow, he'll hold trilateral talks with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the Dutch Prime Minister, shaping all his meetings, the increasing nuclear threat Russia poses. With that attack on a facility in Ukraine earlier this week and Russia's army now closing in on another, the situation is becoming more urgent by the hour. The humanitarian crisis, also something Trudeau wants to show leadership on, hoping to build a coalition of nations to support the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, now refugees in neighboring countries. There have been questions about why Trudeau is spending time talking to nations already in lockstep with Canada instead of outreach to those criticized for not doing more to push back against Putin. Senior officials say those conversations are happening and multiple diplomatic channels are being worked simultaneously. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, London. Ottawa says now is the time for Canadians in Russia to leave, warning that sanctions and the possibility of, quote, Russian retaliation pose a serious risk to essential services. But as Olivia Stefanovic shows us, some Canadians are willing to assume that risk. Despite the Canadian government warning its citizens to avoid all travel to Russia and for those there to come home, Calgary's Malik Al-Khatib won't leave his private English tutoring job in Moscow. If things get as bad as they are in Ukraine, I, I, would, I would get out um, for sure. But as of right now, uh, to me, it's not worth it. Although life is getting costlier, Al-Khatib is preparing for the long haul. Um, the family that I work for, uh, they decided to buy like 20 packs of, of uh, toilet paper, like 20 big packs of toilet paper, like just, just in case we get banned from toilet paper as well. With Western airspace closed to Russian flights, it's becoming increasingly difficult to leave the country. Our advice right now is to find whatever way you can to leave Russia. And Ottawa can't guarantee help. We have some real concerns about the safety and well-being of people who may be in Russia today. The U.S. has also told its citizens to leave Russia immediately, warning of potential harassment by Russian security officials. <laughs> Russia is also cracking down on anti-war protesters. This would basically lead to maybe a kind of renewal of the Cold War. This Ukrainian-born political scientist says Ottawa should find a way to help dual and Russian citizens study or even live in Canada. Many of them do not support this war in, in Ukraine and they are basically now affected, affected by such sanctions. Back in Moscow, Al-Khatib is scrambling to get his mom out of the country as prices double and triple. British Airways has cancelled her her flight and I had to rebook her on a Turkish Airlines flight through Turkey. The federal government says there are at least 1,200 Canadians in Russia. They still have access to consular services, at least for now. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. The crisis is being deeply felt here in Canada. Manitoba, for example, has 180,000 residents of Ukrainian descent. That's the highest percentage of any province. Marina von Stackelberg shows us many worried about family overseas are taking matters into their own hands. No more war! Stretching across Manitoba's legislative grounds, thousands showed up to rally. After dealing with the initial shock, they want to take action. Many here have family back in Ukraine. We are far away and uh, every when I'm calling my mother, she doesn't answer within the three rings, three seconds. My, my heart just stops, right? Because it's uh, so it's really hard to be not with them right now. And uh, of course, we, we would try to do anything that we can. They're collecting donations of money and supplies for the fight overseas and refugees who may soon call Manitoba home. There's a spot where people can write letters to their members of parliament. After Russia, Canada has the largest Ukrainian diaspora in the entire world. And the largest proportion of them live here in Manitoba. And so what's happening overseas is being felt very much right here. Well, it's good that they feel comfortable asking. It's very real for them. Some immigrated at rec as recently as three weeks ago. And so they are very much in contact with their relatives there. Ivana Luki has set up a special station just for children. There's coloring books with simple facts that explain what's happening. She's Ukrainian and a school psychologist. Here to help parents figure out how to talk to their kids about what's happening. Just giving them a chance to, to be kids and to play and to ask questions. And they're, gonna, they're just saving space for that, those questions. Um, trying to be honest with what's going on right now and um, 
just trying to keep a routine at home as much as possible when you can. Organizers say this is also their way of helping Manitoba's Ukrainian community grapple with what's transpired. We're all going through this together and being able to be here to talk to one another and to look each other in the eye, I think is a really wonderful experience in the sense of it shows that we're not alone. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Winnipeg. This week, Canada unveiled a new program to allow an unlimited number of Ukrainians to come here as temporary visitors. But some are wondering if that's fair to refugees from other regions. Philip Lee Shannock looks into that issue. From the safety of an Ontario home, Rakshana Ahmadi thinks of her family every day. She worked as an interpreter for the Canadian government. The Taliban start searching home by home for people who was working with the government and people who was working for foreign countries. Last summer, she and her family were fleeing Afghanistan when suicide bombers attacked the Kabul airport. She got out, but her family was left behind. Now she's worried the world has moved on. The sad point for me is when this situation happened in Ukraine, I think all the countries forget about, uh, about Afghanistan, what is going on here. The federal government says the offer of a two-year emergency stay for Ukrainians is not part of Canada's refugee resettlement program. The vast majority of people who are coming here want to go back when it's safe to do so. But Ahmadi says her family is also in immediate danger and she'd like Canada and other Western countries to extend that offer of safety to others in need. This former Afghan military prosecutor fled to Pakistan when the country fell to the Taliban. He wants to come to Canada. On the first days that Kabul were uh, took uh, in the hands of Taliban, I applied for the government of Can for a Canadian program, but uh, I did not... Uh, received any answer. His visitor's visa runs out in nine days. He fears he'll end up back in Afghanistan. Ali Frogi fled Afghanistan as a child and now lives in an Indonesian refugee camp where he documents daily life. He says refugees are treated differently depending on what they look like. Let's treat refugees equally without seeing their colors. Since August, Canada has accepted 8,500 Afghan refugees and has committed to welcoming 40,000. Meanwhile, since January 1st, more than 6,000 Ukrainians have arrived. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. Preparations are underway here in Lviv as many brace for what could happen next. All that digging has been to unearth a very old bomb shelter. We'll take you inside a bunker from the past and hear from the people who may need to use it again in the very near future. How do you keep it together for them? We just uh, told them that this is a game. Also ahead, a go public investigation. When I first heard of this, I thought, this can't be real. Why she was denied her dream home because of someone else's bad credit. And the national interview with Ryan Reynolds. I wondered what you'd seem like in person, and you do seem very level-headed, so... You just wait. <laughs> what you may not know about the Canadian superstar. We're back after the break. On this Sunday in the city of Lviv, a moment of prayer for a country under siege. This day is known in Ukraine as Forgiveness Sunday. But here in this crowded service, there is very little forgiveness for the war underway. Right now, Lviv is flooded with people from across Ukraine. The city has become a hub for those trying to flee to Poland. So the more important Lviv becomes, the more anxious the people here get about what is coming. The city, like Kyiv, does have access to some bunkers and some shelters, but not every home has them. So out of a desire to do something, some residents are unearthing a bit of the past in the name of securing their future. So the digging here is fresh, and we've been asked not to say exactly where we are for a very good reason, because the people of Lviv have been digging out an old bomb shelter. Come have a look. There's a fair amount of dispute about when this was built. People who are in their 60s tell us they used to play in it when they were little kids. Others say it's possibly post-Second World War. Some say much earlier than that. You can see how it shifted over time, though. This is an old lock. 
This is brand new electricity that was put in just in the last few days. As people have become more anxious here in Lviv, electricians, engineers, private citizens have been coming in to try to excavate this and build it up. This is not an official effort, it's just an effort on the part of people who are afraid and feel like they have to do something. Over here, some brand new digging over the last few days to unearth this. So this is an egress point. You can see it's not actually that far underground. Uh, so people can get out, people can get in, and crucially, it's also for ventilation. Remember what I said about kids coming to play down here? In some ways, things don't change. These little two, that's Oscar and Arthur, their families from Kiev, they've moved to Lviv, and their parents have brought them down here in part to something to do and to just keep them playing. They know all these places and uh, they're not scary. Oh. Yeah. They understand what the air attack is and uh, they are okay, they don't cry. It's like a normal <laughs> for the kids now. How do you keep it together for them? Uh, it's like a play. Hmm. Um, when we uh, listen to the uh, um, air, like... Uh, the sirens? Yeah, sirens. For the first time, we just uh, told them that this is a game and uh, we need to run to the uh, some shelter. You are a great mom. <laughs> Thank you. So last thought about these bunkers and shelters. The government officials really aren't very happy with them because they're not very deep. They're not particularly safe. But this conversation has gone beyond being a theoretical one to practical. People are sort of building brand new benches, putting them in here. There's brand new electricity. They know it's not ideal. It's probably not very safe. But the real fear is, at some point, it may be all that they've got. Imagine turning an air raid siren into a game. What an incredible mother, as you pointed out. Now, the last time you and I talked on The National, you were in Poland, Adrian, on the border with Ukraine, and then you and your team walked across the border early on Saturday. Take us through what that was like. Well, Ian, we had hoped to drive across, but the lineups going into Ukraine have been swelling. So people going to fight, going home, because they just can't you know, bear to leave their parents and their grandparents alone, and, and lots of humanitarian workers and trucks going in. So walking really became the only option if we were to get here before curfew. It, it's interesting to walk across, because as you go one way, there are waves of people coming the other way. So we've got a fast, determined walk heading in, an utterly exhausted trudge, if you will, coming out. And one of the first things you see in Ukraine is a help desk for international soldiers. So it's just a few card tables uh, under a tent where people register and then literally get their marching orders. And Adrian, you've been saying you've been struck by just how quiet it was at the border. Yeah, this is true. Uh, I have covered a, a lot of crises where people all over the world are forced to flee. And there is something really worrying when people are so very quiet, you know, the kids especially. It sort of looks like utter exhaustion and shock and trauma. This has all happened blisteringly fast, and yet the way out is so long and it's so slow and it's so tiring and just getting across the border is taking everything out of them. Uh, that almost 15 kilometer long lineup of cars to get out of Ukraine is going to get bigger the more people worry about the airstrikes and the missile strikes coming at them possibly from Belarus. So the stress on the faces is extraordinary. And so has again tonight your reporting and you'll be back tomorrow with more coverage from Lviv. We'll see you then. Thank you. I had tonight some of the day's other news, including a gold public investigation into why it can be difficult to fix a mistake on your credit report, even when it's not your fault. But first. I was like a real introvert as a kid. I did not like Ryan Reynolds reflects on fame, the importance of giving back, and growing up in British Columbia. Wow, can I see it? Yeah, that's the old stomping grounds. You know, I used to face the national interview is next. to make sure everything was just perfect. Get ready to run. He seems at home in almost every genre. Canada's Ryan Reynolds certainly is a Hollywood star. He's also an entrepreneur and active in charity work, including raising money for Ukrainian refugees. 
In a break from some of the difficult news lately, we sat down to talk about his movie career and other ventures. But for a guy whose Twitter and Instagram handles are Van City Rentals, I decided to start with a challenge about his hometown. We're going to play a game. Sure, um, and, I love games. I'm going to show you three pictures. <laughs> and uh, you get one point if you identify the picture, and you get five points if you come up with an interesting story about the picture. Wow, yeah. I like this game already. Yeah, so here you go. Here's the first picture. First picture, that is Kitsilano Secondary School. Yeah. That is my high school. Yeah, so you get the one point for that. Tell me something interesting about your time in high school. Uh, in high school, uh, okay, terrified to go to. I went, I, I actually was at a school called uh, Prince of Wales before that. I did an amazing program there where I, that's sort of where I became an environmentalist to a certain degree, which was this program called Trek, mm -hmm. Clatwa Trek they had, which is kids get to immerse themselves in the outdoors. They spend six months doing school and then six months, you just you do a year's worth of schoolwork in six months and then the rest of the time you're outside. And amazing, amazing program. But then I had to go back into the main school system and I was like a real introvert as a kid. I did not like school. I did not like the social pressures. I didn't like the dynamics. See, that, uh, that sounds like it might be myth-making because you seem hardly introverted now, but you really yeah. were like that? Okay, this is a bit of a tangent, but <laughs> I, I am, I have always had this sort of thing where, you know, like I, I, I think about Dave Letterman sometimes when mm -hmm. I would go on the Dave Letterman show and and that's a big talk show to go on. And, you know, he doesn't, obviously he doesn't do the show anymore, but I remember he was always the guy that, that other performers when they were going to the show had some reverence for, a uh, little bit of fear, because you don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. uh, if he doesn't like you, how does this go? You know, that sort of thing. And I used to stand behind that curtain as they were announcing my name and thinking, I'm gonna die. Like I'm actually, when that curtain opens, I'm either just gonna like fall out of it like a, <laughs> like a comedic corpse bashing mm -hmm. off the ground, or I'm just gonna projectile vomit over everybody. And as soon as he called my name and I start to step out there, I noted that this sort of little guy takes over. And this little guy's like confident and kinda, he can throw a joke around here and there and all that stuff. And then I realized that that's the same guy that is like responsible for my career, responsible for a lot of the things that I get to do. He's, he's not necessarily real, the real me, but he keeps me safe and protects me. So that, that, that guy has kind of been around since high school. And you could try, I could turn them on and off um, a lot better as I got older. But when I was younger, I, I struggled with that stuff. And I, and I don't look back at it with a boo-hoo story. I mean, you know, every, I've learned more from failures and insecurities and all sorts of things than I've ever learned from successes in life. Second uh, picture. Second picture. Oh, gosh. I would, now, I would say that that's probably a not up-to-date photo of the 25th and Oak Safeway store. It Am is a completely right? up-to-date picture. My wife took this picture this week. What? Can I see it? Yeah. That's the old stomping grounds. You know, I used to face this fridge out. I, like yeah. I would have to make sure everything was just perfectly smooth and all the labels out. I loved working at Safeway. I worked, uh, a lot of the time I worked there was midnight to 8 a.m., the sort of graveyard shift, which was interesting. And, I, and then I moved to cashier. I did everything in that store. I you cashier. were a cashier there? Yeah, I was also a cashier. I also bagged groceries. I used to bag Sarah McLaughlin's groceries. Wow. And I always noted that she was incredibly kind to everybody that she met in that store. Didn't have to be. No one even knew it was her. Half the time she had like a toque pulled down and I always knew that was her. And yeah, she was awesome. Again, full five points full five for points. that. Okay, final picture here, Landmark, Vancouver. Landmark, well that's the viaduct right there. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I wanna shoot, baby. Shoot, shoot, baby. That was my first sort of foray into producing, properly producing a movie and managing budgets and all kinds of stuff. And boy, that Georgia Viaduct saved our life. It really did because we didn't, we had to cut all these huge action sequences and replace spectacle with character, which later in my life became an, an enormous lesson in marketing and every other business I would pursue. That necessity being the mother of invention is the greatest, greatest creative tool you could ever have. But a lot of those lessons were kind of forged in 2015 as I sat on that Georgia Viaduct trying to figure out how the hell I'm gonna get through this movie on the paltry amount of money they've given us to shoot it. One of the really interesting things for me to see your work is, is your voice seems consistent. So from movies to ads to viral videos that you do, um, and, and let's talk about the ads for a moment. Like, how did that come about? Um, I created a marketing company. I created a production company called Maximum Effort mm -hmm. Productions, which became, uh, or an offshoot of it, became Maximum Effort Marketing, which became a juggernaut. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it happened sort of by accident. Um, I bought Aviation Gin, which is a gin company that I couldn't really find anywhere, so I, I, I knew it was the top-rated gin, you know, in the world at the time, and 
there was such a small or sort of low supply of it. So I saw a real space there to kind of grow this company and, uh, and I needed marketing to back that up. So I started my own marketing company uh, with my partner, George Dewey. You know, people come up to me all the time and they say, what makes aviation gin so delicious? Most of the time I run away because non-celebrities frighten me. At the end of the day, it's just about telling stories. I mean, whether you're telling stories in marketing or whether you're telling stories in movies, um, that's always the sort of congruent sort of factor that ties them all together, is it's storytelling. They asked me to write you a number To show you just how we all feel We know you're a fan of the land we call Canada But here's what I've got to reveal That Canada loves you back Canada loves you back So, actor, uh, entrepreneur, creative person, and philanthropist. I mean, you and your wife seem to have really embraced charitable giving. And so that video, for example, uh, for the Governor General's Award at the end, there's that those credits that roll or the thank yous, basically. Mm. I assume that a lot of people in your business give a certain amount of money, but the thing that with you is that it just seems so thoughtful mm. and, and varied. And I just wonder, this is actually my wife's question for you. Mm -hmm. she, she was wondering, where does this come from? Where, where in your life or your wife's life mm -hmm. did the inspiration come to be so charitable? Um, oh boy, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, that we're, you know, part of why I've been successful, I think, in my business life is, is being somewhat self-aware. And, and I understand the idea that when you extract a lot from a system, you need to put back in, put some back in as well. So um, part of it comes from that. I can't, you know, safely say that I would enjoy my position in life if I wasn't sharing it. Um, you know, not just sharing wealth, but also sharing power, you know, stepping aside where appropriate as well. Um, and you can do all these things, and you know, at the end of the day, like you're still doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't change you know, much for your own personal situation other than it really feels great. But typically the, the, the organizations that we give to and the organizations that we support and, and the foundations that we create are usually something to do with sustainability. You know, sustainability in communities, um, sustainability in, in, you know, infrastructure to create jobs for folks who don't normally have that access or opportunity to those jobs. And um, that's the stuff I really love. Sick Kids Foundation is a big one that we, we do stuff for every year, uh, you know, and that is a sustainable way to give. It isn't a one-time thing. It sort of just it grows and grows and grows. And I think, I think of, you know, sharing, I don't want to call it charity, but sharing as an investment. They're all just investments, you know, and might not necessarily return dollars to you, but they'll, they'll, make, they'll make the world a better place. They'll make Canada a better place. I and mean, at the end of the day, that's kind of the goals like I grew up I grew up here and I want it to be better you're having a moment uh, it's been going on for a while but it's still like we're kind of a lot of success right you have a lot of success now in a business that can be really fickle mm. and so do you wonder if in five or ten years all this magic will still be as potent as it is right now you know Ian I've never had like a high expectation of anything there's no part of me that's like I deserve this or I expect <laughs> this um, you know, anybody that's managed to come as far as I've come in this, in this business, it's a, it's a, certainly hard work is there, but there's a huge component of, of, of luck and circumstance and being in the right place at the right time. And, and then also being a person who is given access and opportunity at an, at an early age that I was born into and understanding that privilege and what that is. So I've never, I, my highest goal in show business was to be the wacky neighbor in a sitcom. <laughs> Quite literally, like if I had go to Los Angeles, I started an improv comedy. If I mm -hmm. could go to Los Angeles, I could get a job as the wacky neighbor in a sitcom. I would be set. That was all I ever really wanted. So everything else that's happened, and it's all happened quite slowly, has been a kind of an aggregate. Um, if you want to call it fame or any of that stuff, it's always been very slow. Today we honor with the 2,596 star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Ryan Reynolds. By virtue of that fact, it's, it's much easier to kind of watch and regulate and keep your head screwed on right because it's not happening. I don't know how these young kids who just have this overnight success that is like a tidal wave, I don't know how they keep their heads, and, and oftentimes they don't. 
you know, and I, and I see the pitfalls of, of, of what this business can be like when it, when it happens sort of in a flash flood kind of sense. So for me, I was very lucky. I wasn't try, I was trying to make things happen fast at times and other times I would just push it away. Um, so it happened very slowly and it was in a, in a way kind of gave, gave me a sort of a, the benefit of immersion uh, that, that was, you know, that not everyone gets. I wondered what you'd seem like in person and you do seem very level-headed, so. <laughs> you just that's, wait. That's, <laughs> I am gonna to toss all of this expensive camera gear around as soon as I leave. It's just one of the things I like to do at the end of an interview <laughs> to create more of a myth. Excellent. Like, oh God, totally normal on camera and then just lost it. We'll keep rolling the then. Yeah, yeah, I roll for it. It'll be really, it'll be great, great footage, great ratings, I think. So dramatic, he's so dramatic. Next, how a shared name cost one woman her dream home. When I first heard of this, I thought, this can't be real. It was a simple mistake by the Credit Bureau, but no simple fix. A Go Public Investigation is next. Now to go public investigation about your credit report and just how hard it can be to fix. An Ottawa woman found that out the hard way. She has the same name as someone with bad credit and it cost her dearly. Rosa Marcatelli has her story. Jessica Rochon and her wife thought they'd be out of this neighborhood by now, living on a quiet street in a house of their own. Instead, they're stuck renting, denied a mortgage because of someone else's bad credit after Rochant's credit history was mixed with that of a stranger with almost the same name. The middle name is different. When I first heard of this, I thought, this can't be real. I mean, we worked so hard to, you know, in our careers to have, you know, a comfortable life and made sure to always pay our bills on time. The other, Jessica Rochant, a common name, didn't want to be interviewed. For months, this Rochant tried to get Equifax to fix the problem. But despite the company telling her it would take no more than 20 days, five months later, Rochant was still waiting. Meanwhile, prices for homes in Ottawa kept going up, and she says she's now priced out of the market. As it takes longer and longer, I become more incredulous. Like, it's just almost laughable at this point because it's so ridiculous. Go Public is hearing from a lot of people who say Canada's two main credit reporting agencies, TransUnion and Equifax, are doing a bad job of correcting errors on credit reports. Experts say that's because in many parts of the country, there's no deadline to fix errors. Unlike the U.S., where there's one rule across the country, credit reporting agencies there have 30 days to fix problems. It's very much... Uh, into the hands of the consumers to continue to harass Equifax and TransUnion, which is a daunting process for any consumer. Equifax Canada blames the pandemic, saying the delays were partly caused by a reduced rotating workforce and slower connection times for agents required to work remotely, but says it's working on a fix. The company fixed the mistake on Roshan's credit record after hearing from GoPublic. She's relieved but still frustrated, knowing the delay means she and her wife likely won't be able to afford a house anytime soon. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you if you have a tip for the team to investigate. Send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Stay with us. The moment is next. Watching the difficult news overseas, Canadians are doing what they can to help. In Calgary, that means pinching pierogies, hundreds of them. The proceeds will go to help the people of Ukraine, and this act of delicious kindness is our moment. We're making uh, pierogies for Banana Kip as a fundraiser. Um, to send to Ukraine, so humanitarian aid to Ukraine. We have 260 pounds of, of potatoes that we are making. Pierogies have been a staple fundraiser in the Ukrainian community f forever. Our church here today was built a lot from the women making uh, pierogies that came in that immigrated from Ukraine. And people love our, uh, our pierogies, and so they come out and buy them, and then we're able to uh, raise funds. There's a feeling of peace being with other people that are experiencing the same thing, you know, and so we share stories. 
and we support each other. The Ukrainian people are amazing. I've never been so proud to be Ukrainian as I am at the moment. It really is heartwarming. What a perfectly beautiful fundraiser. And I think that phrase that we just heard, that she's never been more proud to be Ukrainian, I think that echoes something we heard in the story from Winnipeg earlier in the newscast. So imagine you have a Ukrainian food, you have a tradition of making that food as a fundraiser, and they're successful. They raised $60,000 for their church last summer, and they've made a hundred dozen pierogies so far as part of this. That is The National for March the 6th. Good night.